Since the dawn of time, man has strived to take the human race further, faster and higher than ever before. Hidden within ancient tombs, encoded on sacred walls, are the secrets of the ancients' extraordinary machines. Their visionary designs predate today's cars, trains and aeroplanes by thousands of years. This is the story of how man went from inventing the wheel to conquering the skies. Among the debris left behind by the great civilizations of the past are clues that tell us how the foundations of modern day transport were laid down thousands of years ago. In South America, explorers have discovered this beautiful model of a strange insect. Does it prove that the ancients understood the physics of modern aerodynamics? In China, ancient rocketry inspired man's quest for the stars. But did the first rocket machines really work? Were the first rocket-powered aircraft actually built more than 500 years ago? In Britain, a model maker is planning to test drive a gunpowder-fueled rocket vehicle, once used as a lethal weapon. Did modern dragsters first begin with this 600-year-old bullet car? And in the archives of the Cairo Museum, this mysterious model has been forgotten for 70 years. Now it's being re-examined by 21st century science. Will our groundbreaking investigation unveil that the Egyptians actually understood how to fly two millennia before the first flight? These discoveries all lead to the question, were ancient versions of cars and planes far more advanced than we originally thought? The quest for automatic transport is not a modern-day notion. It was very much on the minds of the ancients. Two and a half thousand years ago, ancient Greece was at the zenith of its powers. Greek ideas, goods, language and culture dominated the eastern Mediterranean. At the heart of its infrastructure lay a seemingly intractable problem. How could people avoid the need to travel hundreds of miles by sea to get to a place just four miles away by land? Let's say you were travelling from Athens to Sicily, you had to take your ship all the way around the outside of the Peloponnese. And when you've got a combination of currents, winds against you, and 200 metre high cliffs, uh, it's an ideal situation for pirates who lived down in the peninsulas there to row out, throw your sailors overboard and take over the ship. So it was a, has it was a hazardous business taking your ship around rather than over. This navigation nightmare inspired the Greeks to set out on an epic building project in the 19th century. The result is one of the wonders of modern Greece, the Corinth Canal. Cut deep into the steep cliffs and around 75 feet wide, the canal is a triumph of industrial age engineering. It was completed in 1893 over two millennia too late for the ancient Greeks. So how did the ancient Greek engineers really overcome what seemed like an impossible challenge? The first person to have the idea of transporting ships over the Dialkas was uh, probably the tyrant Periander in the 6th century BCE. Um, and he realized that by building a roadway, uh, he could reduce the friction for haulage across from one side to the other. It's now believed that this simple limestone runway holds the key to discovering the Greeks' ingenious solution. The ancient Greeks would have used one of the first mega-movers in history, a crane, to raise the superships out of the water. Using a sophisticated system of pulleys, the vessels were hauled onto trolleys by hordes of slaves and oxen. With the pre-cut grooves guiding the trolleys, this was the ancient world's first railway. I'm not talking about a truck that is uh, only two axles with a total of four wheels, but I imagine something with multiple axles, with multiple wheels. And as you make up uh, your way across the DL cusp, you have to keep the wheels of the trolley very strictly on course with these grooves, otherwise you get into all kinds of trouble uh, as you pull the ship over. 
For over 1,300 years, the Diolcos Railway powered the trading empire of the central Mediterranean. Yet it remains one of history's great lost opportunities. In the first century, the brilliant inventor Heron of Alexandria developed the world's first steam ball. Had he made the small leap to mastering pistons, we would have had, perhaps, the world's first ever automated railway system. None of these innovations would have been possible without the invention of a single, simple concept, the wheel. In its 5,000 year history, the wheel has completely transformed how we travel. How did we get from this simple circle to today's monster vehicles? The answer begins with the greatest road builders and chariot makers, the Romans. They built an astonishing network of roads with staggering precision, but we're only just discovering how advanced their vehicles really were. This vehicle is called Caruca Dormitoria. In the center of this word, you already find the modern word car, which shows us the importance of the Roman technology and development. This ancient vehicle mirrors the design of the first modern day cars, built more than two millennia later. The wheelbase can be reconstructed by tracks found in Roman roads, so we have an idea how broad those cars were in Roman times. 2,000 years ago, Roman cars faced tough terrain that could ruin any wooden vehicle. How did their transport survive such a battle? The answer is an early version of an essential component of today's vehicles, the suspension system. Like a modern car, this ancient vehicle has got a suspension system. The whole coach box is swinging on these leather straps and on one hand are suspended by those metal rings, on the other hand by this decorative and also functional element which depicts the goddess Victoria. This technology changed the car from a method of transport to an integral part of Roman life. We're only just beginning to fully understand how much car culture was a part of the ancients' life. Here in the Evros region of northern Greece, archaeologists have uncovered a treasure trove of ancient artifacts. Professor Trian Tafilos is leading an investigation to discover the secrets that lie locked within this Roman burial ground. Secrets of the ancient chariot makers. Looking at the wheels of the chariots unearthed at the burial ground, we can conclude that their shape suggests a fairly advanced development. This design survived right up to the 1960s in the region's villages. The case takes another twist when the team uncovers the ancient artifacts that the Romans buried with their dead. Here in the graves where they cremated the dead, funeral gifts were placed next to the body. Generally, the artifacts are made from glass, copper, and some gold jewelry. From the chariots, there were decorative items of copper, and functional parts made from iron and copper. The Evros find is an amazing discovery. Not only was transport a vital part of life in the ancient world, but important enough to take into the afterlife. Treasures buried with the carts show the enormous value the ancients placed on their vehicles, just as many people do with their own cars today. Transport was a sophisticated and highly valued aspect of life in the ancient world that man was continuously trying to improve and develop. But a remarkable find has turned everything we thought we knew about the ancient world on its head. Within these pages are extremely advanced designs for the first fully automated car, powered by steam. The racing cars of the 21st century are built using the latest technology and travel at speeds of over 200 miles an hour. Yet these million pound racing cars would never have made it into existence without the technical savvy of the world's first car manufacturers. In the 1400s, an Italian doctor named Giovanni Fontana developed a vehicle for the sick and immobile that was to change history. He did compile a manuscript 
which is called De Rebus Bellicis, uh, while he was a doctor, in which he describes a strange vehicle whereby an uh, invalid could actually move himself forward, a bit like a modern wheelchair. Um, he would pull on ropes, which through pulleys would eventually turn the axles of his vehicle. Using Fontana's original designs, we can reconstruct the machine that allowed humans to power themselves for the first time. Well, basically, the man holds on the rope through pulleys, and these would turn the wheels. So you are really hauling yourself along, but getting a lot of advantage by using block and tackle rather than just pulling yourself. Giovanni's visionary design saw an interconnecting series of gears powered by a person pulling on a rope. Part bicycle, part car, part sedan chair, this astonishing contraption signaled the dawn of a new era in which man moved using a machine. Scientist, inventor, artist, engineer, Leonardo da Vinci had one of the most brilliant minds in history. In his notebooks are the designs for machines to cause maximum destruction on the battlefield. One of Leonardo's inventions that attracted a lot of attention is the tank. What it consists of is a conical roof with a viewing slit around the top, made of heavy planks, and around the edge of it are a series of guns um, which can fire in a completely all-round direction. And inside, there are two cams, these things you turn, which then operate the wheels. So Leonardo envisages this device firing from all its guns, probably deafening the people inside, um, pushing into the enemy and causing mayhem. The exact specifications of his design remain unknown to historians today. But based on what other cannons used at the time, each gun could have fired 300-pound cannonballs at a terrified enemy. Although there's no evidence that his blueprints left the drawing board, Leonardo created this extraordinary design 400 years before tanks were first seen on the battlefields of the First World War. Another of Leonardo's remarkable designs is a fully automated, spring-driven car. Leonardo is looking to see how a wheeled vehicle can entirely within itself have motive power and travel. There's this famous design for a spring-driven car. Leonardo's pioneering blueprint for a modern car combined early robotics with advanced mechanics. Five centuries after he designed it, modern engineers have reconstructed how it would have worked. And Leonardo is looking towards this design of tent springs which he then has to regulate to make sure they don't expend their power too quickly or unevenly. So it is self-contained. You could put that machine down much as you could put a car down with, say, the accelerator pressed down and it would go. Leonardo's car was driven forward by a series of springs that stored up energy, then transmitted it to each wheel through a complex system of gears connected to a regulator that allowed the car to move forward at a constant speed, rather than quickly at the start and slower as the spring wound down. In the same way that today's cars are fueled by petrol, Leonardo's automobile was fueled by the power of a heavy-duty spring. By using clockwork technology, Leonardo da Vinci had designed history's first self-propelled car. It is a finite travel because a spring, however well you regulate it, will ultimately run down, but I suppose a petrol engine, if you don't fill it up, also, also runs down. If we look at what Leonardo's doing, even though he's a man of his time, he is thinking of complicated automated machines which only come about in the Industrial Revolution. Leonardo's design pushed the boundaries of transport technology, laying the foundations for today's cars and trains. The next chapter in the incredible story of the car stars an extraordinary man in extraordinary circumstances. In a remote corner of China, a Belgian priest named Ferdinand Verbis was fleeing religious persecution at the hands of the emperor. But out of adversity was to come genius. 
Buried in ancient texts are his blueprints for the world's first fully automated steam-powered car. The Beast's pioneering design used a cauldron of boiling water fueled by a hot furnace. Up till then, really, horsepower and, and, and manpower was pretty much all that was available. So it was a kind of holy grail in the sense to have a self-propelled vehicle. Recognising the brilliance of Verbeese's invention, the Emperor spared him. Because of his astonishing knowledge of mathematics and astronomy and science, he became a favourite of the Emperor and he actually worked his way up to become head of the Imperial Board of Mathematics. His simple invention founded the technology that would one day power the ships, trains and cars of the modern world. Model maker Richard Windley is going to put Verbeese's steam car to the test for the first time in history. The boiler contains water which is raised to boiling point by a fire underneath. As the pressure rises the steam issues in a, a, a quite a high velocity jet from the nozzle and this drives the fan shaped rotor. We've got a gear reduction of probably something like about 100 to 1 which means that for every 100 revolutions of the fan we only get one at the axle. We're going to need quite a major reduction because this thing is pretty substantial, it's pretty heavy. We don't really know if this is going to work, in theory it should work. It really depends on how much pressure we can get inside the vessel. Although the first modern automobile wouldn't be invented until around 400 years later, many of its fundamental principles are similar to today's cars. One of these similarities is the turbine. As the water starts to boil, the pressure rises, the little turbine will start to spin. The drive will be transmitted through the reduction gears to the axle and the, th the, the whole car should hopefully start to move. The turbine preempted the piston. The inefficiency of this probably stopped it from being developed much further, but it's interesting the fact that some 200 years later the turbine really became of enormous use in terms of electricity generation, jet engines in the present day. The cars, trains and ships of the Industrial Revolution all stem from a turbocharged kettle on wheels. But was ancient development in automated transportation limited to the ground? A new look at the ancient texts has revealed an intriguing clue to the ancients' mastery of air power. Is it conceivable that they actually took to the skies with rocket-powered aircraft? Wind drove the great galleons of the ancients across the ocean for thousands of years. As man watched its irresistible force, he envisaged a remarkable new machine, the wind car. People saying, well, how fast a boat can go when the wind is behind in the sail, we could well think, well, surely it can drive four little wheels and we can move along the ground. Building upon the magnificent designs of ancient Chinese visionaries, Dutch inventor Simon Stevin devised a mechanical chariot powered by the wind. According to legend, it moved like a hurricane. Stevin's wind-powered uh, car was a, a boat on wheels. Well, some say it went at 30 or 40 miles an hour, which is not impossible. I mean, it had, uh, had to have a very level ground to go along. Unreliable winds and poor road conditions meant Stevin's ideas only survived today in extreme land yachting. Instead of wind and water, man turned to an even more potent and explosive source of power, rocket-generated firepower. In the 10th century, a single invention forever changed the battlefield, gunpowder. But this volatile mix of chemicals also changed how we travel. From gunpowder came rocket technology. Ancient texts record how a Chinese official known as Wan Hu carried out a dangerous experiment using a rocket-powered engine. Rockets work by a controlled explosion or burn pushing a force out of the back of the machine. This produces an equal force forward that propels the device. Dreaming of a journey to the stars, Wan Hu attached 47 gunpowder rockets to a wooden chair, each one lit by a servant. According to the story, he was blasted out of existence. This fantastic tale has left a baffling mystery. 
Could Wan Hu really have mastered rocket technology over 500 years before NASA's first manned flight? Model maker Ben Jarvis is to reconstruct Wan Hu's incredible design using bamboo, string, gunpowder, and a little guesswork. Bamboo is a, is a very, very strong material. You can actually uh, put a reasonable amount of pressure inside it without it bursting, much the same as carbon fiber tubes are used today in modern rockets. This is a tiny barometric altimeter. This simply measures air pressure, uh, so we're actually going to put it on the chair, and this will be able to determine exactly how high it's gone, plus or minus a few feet. In a remote part of the countryside, Ben prepares to launch his model of one who's incredible rocket chair into the skies. 600 years ago, one who would have been strapped into the chair himself, risking his life in pursuit of new knowledge and grander horizons. The principles on which these gunpowder motors work are, are basically exactly the same as uh, NASA's rockets. Um, obviously NASA use liquid fuels which are slightly more complicated and slightly higher performance but in terms of the combustion of, of materials in order to produce thrust they're, they're basically exactly the same. It's the moment of reckoning for the world's first rocket chair. Armed, firing in five, four, three, two, one. Ignition! That did pretty much what I kind of thought it was going to do. I think uh, possibly had it had a bigger kite on top of it, we might have got a little bit of a glide there. He looks like he survived that. I think Wan Hu would probably have come out of that alive, albeit uh, probably a little bit shaken. I think basically that we, we've proven that Wan Hu's 1500s design probably was a little bit flawed. So I think this time around we're going to use modern technology and a bit of modern aerodynamics knowledge to uh, see if we could actually get Wan Hu up into the sky in a, in a slightly more spectacular fashion. Ben makes a crucial alteration to his model. This time he places the gunpowder engines beneath the chair, just like a modern space rocket. Firing in five! Four, three, two, one, fire! Um, just listening to the uh, the beeps coming out of the altimeter, it's saying that it's actually reached about 250 feet in altitude. So uh, that's a big, big improvement over the three feet that the last one reached. So uh, uh, as I said, I, th I think it's all down to uh, modern aerodynamics by putting some fins at the bottom and launching it upwards rather than horizontally. Um, uh, Wan Hu went a lot further, but unfortunately I think he's uh, probably suffered at least a broken ankle, possibly worse, so uh, uh, all in all I, uh, I doubt it's going to catch on as a viable form of transportation, to be honest. Today, Wan Hu's remarkable legacy is written in the sky. NASA has named one of the moon's craters after him. It took the West five centuries to master this new eastern rocketry, but when it did, it created a vehicle straight out of the future. In the 15th century, Venetian engineer Giovanni di Fontana unleashed the rocket car with a single brilliant invention, gunpowder fuel. Gunpowder fuel burns in an explosive but controlled way, taking place over a period of time instead of all at once. Not far from Northampton is Santa Pod Raceway, home of European drag racing. Here, dragsters reach speeds of over 300 miles per hour, drawing upon the explosive technology Giovanni Fontana developed 600 years earlier. It set the world record last year over the standing quarter mile at 336 mile an hour. The trouble with anything that's thrust driven like this is no drive through the wheels, so you're relying on the air to move the mass. Once the mass is moving, then the jet will actually pick up speed. It sucks air in the front, squeezes the air in the compressor, introduces fuel in the combustion chamber where it creates an explosion, where you get an expansion of air, and then it blows it out the back into the exhaust. But Fontana's revolutionary rocket car has never been tested in practice. Richard Windley plans to change that. Basically all we have is a vehicle with rollers. He called it the fleeing tortoise, so we've some idea of the scale of it. It's powered by a standard black powder rocket. Black powder rammed into a tube under quite high pressure until it becomes almost solid. This slows the speed of burning down so it doesn't explode, although they quite often do explode as well. 
we're on unproven ground really. It may go straight, it may spin round, it may overturn, it may explode. It'll be interesting to find out. It's the boom or bust moment for Fontana's rocket car. Against the odds, the volatile fuel fires the engine and the vehicle reaches speeds of 40 miles an hour. Richard's historic test run at last proves that a little-known Italian inventor is the father of today's super speedsters. Well, that seemed to be reasonably dramatic. Probably went about 30, 40 yards. Yeah, that was, that was good. This was no innocent innovation, but a 600-year-old weapon of terror. We've got to bear in mind that these things would be carrying incendiaries. That whole thing would be flaming as it hurtled towards the enemy. If they were setting off whole barrages of these things, the effect would have been absolutely terrifying. For thousands of years, man dreamed of one day making the ultimate journey, flight, the journey to the heavens. Early pioneers from China and Renaissance Europe developed extraordinary flying machines. But according to history, flight itself remained only a distant fantasy until the Wright brothers in 1903. Now, new evidence threatens to rewrite the story of how we learned to fly. All across South America, from the desert plains of Peru to the jungle kingdoms of the Amazon, the indigenous people have depicted nature for centuries. We've discovered the secrets of their culture through murals, pottery and artefacts. In 1965, deep in the dense Colombian rainforest, a team of explorers made an intriguing discovery. Almost a thousand years ago, an ancient people known as the Kumbayan forged these beautiful brooches from gold and copper alloy. At first glance, they appear to be small winged insects, but a second look reveals something highly unusual about these objects. Their design carries anomalies found in no air-breathing creatures in the natural world. Normally you find it only with fishes, uh, but uh, no animal anywhere uh, has vertical fins. They actually have wings, but of course not on the low edge. All these models have on the low edge uh, the, the wings. All birds have of course the, the wings on the upper side, and we have it here on the arms or something like that. Investigation of the brooch's design reveals some strange anomalies. All insects' wings are on the top of their body. The brooches have them at the bottom, a feature found only in modern jet aeroplanes. And there's more. Just like these jets, the brooches have delta-shaped wings. A rudder is clearly visible. And ailerons. All these features are found on modern aircraft, like the Space Shuttle. The brooches have left a fascinating mystery. Could this be a model of an aircraft that actually existed? Did the ancient Kumbayans understand how to fly over 1,000 years before the first recorded flight? Peter Belting is an aerodynamics expert with experience in designing fighter jets for the German military. For over a decade, he's been fascinated by the enigmas surrounding the Kumbayans' golden insects. By constructing a 16 to 1 scale model of the artifact, he plans to determine whether this stunning brooch was more like an insect or a supersonic modern aeroplane. You have to find out during the flight, the first flight and so on, where is the center of gravity, uh, what, is, uh, what, what shape the rudder have to have and so on. But uh, I do it uh, since 40 years now and uh, you feel that it's flying or not. The results are stunning. What was once dismissed as a piece of jewellery modelled as an insect actually flies like a 21st century aircraft. We know about 20 of, of these similar artefacts and uh, they are something all the same shape. And uh, it was quite interesting, but we don't know the actual purpose of that. Peter's pioneering research has prompted a re-evaluation of how the skies were conquered. 
but the true origins of the oldest flying machine may prove to be even earlier. In the Temple of Osiris in Egypt, a stunning, some say chilling discovery has been made that's ignited controversy among scholars. Inside the temple, the walls are encoded with hieroglyphics over 2,000 years old. Cut with incredible precision into the ancient rock, these images record the secrets of how generations of pharaohs lived and died. While Egyptologist Dr. Ruth Hover was photographing one of the wall panels, she made a startling discovery. There was a lot of rubble at my feet, and it looked to me like it had fallen off and incised in the stone itself of this oldest temple along the Nile were these figures. I think the images are of ancient technology. They appear to duplicate technology that we now have. At the bottom appears to be a depiction of an aircraft with a clearly defined rudder. At the top is a shape that resembles a helicopter. To the right of this is a streamlined water vessel, below which is what appears to be a submarine. These simple images have ignited a fierce debate amongst Egyptologists and researchers, a debate that challenges all that we thought we knew about the ancient Egyptians. There is something unexplainable and mysterious in this place. Some of the theories say that people came from space to teach the ancient Egyptians. Especially, they say these shapes look like a helicopter. But are we just projecting images familiar to our own civilization onto these ancient symbols? I research the anomalous things that other people aren't willing to look at because they can't figure them out. I'm more than happy to look at them. And there's more. Piecing together other clues from the walls of this sacred tomb, Dr. Ruth Hover believes she's deciphered an ancient code containing a message left 2,000 years ago. A message that the Egyptians planned to stay hidden until the day our society was ready to decode it. Down in the corner of that famous picture, there are a series of symbols. And the numbers are nine. They come out to nine. And nine is also the number of the planet Mars. Did we come from Mars, or was Mars a stopping place, or was this a symbol that we were just arriving at the ability to get to Mars? We're still uncovering the mysteries of Egypt. It's very exciting. And there's a further twist to the riddle of the ancient Egyptians and flight. A hundred years ago, in the oldest known pyramid in Egypt, explorers uncovered a cache of artifacts. Their findings were left ignored and forgotten in the vaults of Cairo Museum for decades. Among them, this small wooden carving. It looks like a bird. It's got a beak marked on, it's got an eye marked on, it's got markings on the tail. It probably was painted with further detail. At first glance, this 2,000-year-old model may seem insignificant, yet the more the Saqqara bird is studied, the deeper the mystery surrounding it becomes. Maybe it was a toy, maybe it was a weather vane, maybe it's a model of something that actually flew. We don't know. In the sacred tombs of the pharaohs lies a treasure trove of artifacts that the ancient kings kept to help provide passage to the afterlife. Many of these beautiful objects are actually scale models, chariots, ships or figures, that the pharaohs had crafted to exacting precision. Given this evidence, the question is, could the Saqqara bird be the blueprint for an ancient aircraft? Beneath the shifting sands of the Giza Plateau are the secrets of the most mysterious ancient civilization of them all, the Egyptians. Even today, scholars remain baffled by the immense complexity of their designs and sheer scale of their ambition. Found in a vast burial site near Egypt's oldest step pyramid, this simple carving, known as the Saqqara bird, is thought to hold the key to an incredible enigma. The most startling feature of the Saqqara bird is its aerodynamic precision. The shape of the wing and the fuselage bear similarities to modern-day aircraft engineering. Could the ancient Egyptians really have possessed the technology of flight over 2,000 years ago? 
man's always seen the bird and he's wanted to fly himself. And I think the Egyptians thought that flying was a godlike property and maybe this was their transcending to become gods. One of the ways they would do it would be through flight. Simon Sanderson is an aerodynamics expert long fascinated by the Saqqara bird. By using the latest scientific techniques, he hopes to find out if the ancient Egyptians developed a model for a full-size flying machine. Employing cutting-edge technology developed by the University of Liverpool, he will conduct the ultimate flying test. The top of the wing is curved on both the leading and the trailing edge, which is not quite the same as a modern-day wing, but is a shape that will give some type of aerodynamic properties. Theory after theory has sought to demystify the Saqqara bird. Now state-of-the-art science will seek to crack it once and for all. The Saqqara bird has provoked this fascinating discussion as to whether the ancient Egyptians did actually know how to fly. After painstaking 3D analysis, Simon and his team begin to construct a model of the Saqqara bird. We're actually going to make a model of the Saqqara bird which is five times bigger than the original because the original was very small. The Saqqara bird is definitely the first step on the way to uh, the understanding of aerodynamics. Here in Manchester, at one of the world's leading aeronautics research institutes, Simon prepares to subject the model to a series of scientific tests. This groundbreaking analysis will at last reveal the secrets of the Saqqara bird's aerodynamics. Using this high-tech wind tunnel, the team builds a complete picture of how the ancient wooden carving would have reacted had it ever flown. By introducing smoke into the tunnel, the team can see clearly whether the model has the aerodynamic properties of flight. We're running the glider at a constant speed, slowly increasing the angle of attack and then measuring the forces which it's producing. That way we can learn about its flight characteristics. The results are promising. At 10 degrees we're producing about a couple of newtons of lift. Well, 10 degrees, it's four and a half newtons well, of lift. So we're actually producing four times the glider's own weight in lift, yeah. so it actually would be flying now. Yeah. That's good. We're getting close to going and building a flyable Egyptian glider. Simon's findings suggest that over 2,000 years ago, the Saqqara bird may have soared high above the Egyptian desert. Yet there remains one potentially fatal flaw, stability. The question that still stands to be learned is what the stability of the Saqqara bird will be like. To crack this new challenge, Simon takes the model to the University of Liverpool, where it must face the same trials as a modern fighter jet. Using data obtained from the wind tunnel experiments, the ancient Saqqara bird is to undergo the most rigorous scientific analysis that 21st century technology can deliver. If the model fails the test, the theory that the ancient Egyptians conquered flight will collapse. Ready to go? Yep, ready for the test. Champion glider pilot Simon Sanderson's skills will be pushed to the limit as he tries to negotiate a virtual 3D landscape modelled on the ancient Giza plateau. Almost as soon as the flight begins, the model spirals violently out of control. Simon is left powerless as the Saqqara bird swings wildly and plummets like a stone. Completely loses it straight away. The simulator shows the Saqqara bird to be terminally unstable. collision with the um, yep. pyramids, so I'm going to take control, I have. Because we haven't got a tailplane on this glider, we have no pitch control, it dives down, rolls over, and then just spirals into the ground. This fundamental flaw leaves the theory that the Saqqara bird flew hanging in the balance. When an aircraft is flying along, if it's disturbed by the wind or if you're controlling it in any way, you need the tail to keep it on the straight and level. I mean, if, if you pitch up, and there's nothing to stop you or bring you back down. You're just going to keep going up and up and up and stall. Without a tailplane, it makes it very, very difficult for aircraft to fly. But what if the Saqqara bird did, in fact, once have a tailplane? At the rear of the carving, a segment has broken away at precisely the point where a tailplane would have been fitted. Back at the wind tunnel, Simon and his engineers make the crucial adjustments to the model. 
With the tailplane added, the revamped Sakara Bird produces a completely new set of aerodynamic data. No one knows if the modifications will be enough to save the Sakara Bird from once again coming crashing down to Earth. Feeding this new data into the flight simulator, Simon will carry out the final test flight of the Sakara Bird. These last few minutes will determine whether his mission ends in success or failure. As the pilot takes the controls, the model begins to climb towards the heavens. The Saqqara bird glides effortlessly high above the Egyptian plateau, riding the airstream like an eagle. Over 2,000 years after the ancient Egyptians carved this mysterious bird, modern technology has proved beyond doubt that it could have flown. It was incredible. And the Egyptians had very sophisticated knowledge in, in other areas, um, so why not in aerodynamics as well? There remains another unanswered question. Could the Egyptians have stumbled unwittingly upon a brilliant design, never realising its incredible aerodynamic properties? The ancient Egyptians had this model and held it out in the wind, which is probably their equivalent of a a modern day wind tunnel, they would have felt that it had lift and they'd have definitely looked as to why it produced lift. They probably wouldn't have come up with the modern understanding of lift, um, but they would have definitely understood something about the properties of the wing. Our discoveries of the ancient world's secrets have transformed our understanding of how aeroplanes, trains and automobiles first came into being. Does modern man take too much credit for pushing the boundaries of engineering? Are we merely reinventing the work of the ancients? If we are just at the tip of the iceberg of how the ancient world really worked, what new inventions remain hidden, ready to rewrite the history?